How's it going, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to No Holds Barred Wrestling Podcast, the Backlash 2016 Review. I am your host, the self-proclaimed great host, Kyle Masters, and I'm me doing the review alone tonight. Cobra Cappy couldn't make it, so I am doing it alone here in the studio. And guys, we are your Canadian-based RB podcast that discusses and reviews Monday Night Raw, Tuesday Night Smackdown from the past week on our show called The Lowdown Show Brand Wars. We also do Twitter polls called The Luke Gallows Polls and WWE Headlines where we talk about any news in the WWE. This show, as well as the own show, is broadcasted live on Spreaker at Spreaker.com slash NHBWP. And after it is done, it is posted in all our outlets, YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, Spreaker, and Stitcher. We are everywhere for your enjoyment and is easier and convenient for you to listen to. So go check us out, guys. And if you'd like to join in on the conversation, have your thoughts, qu- opinions, and questions read on the podcast, tweet us at NoHoldsBarWP or by dropping a comment in the uh, comment section on YouTube below so guys backlash tonight interesting okay definitely i expected less of what we got tonight if you watch the the predictions video me and corporate cappy we weren't expecting much out of this there's less build-up in a lot of matches going into tonight's pay-per-view and just it didn't feel like WWE was going to live up to i guess the hype they're trying to pr- tell us and the hype they're trying to promote and sure enough it definitely got way over the top. Just so much excitement. I can't even I can't even talk right now. Also, it's very late recording this podcast, so I apologize for any botches I may do tonight. I know my corporate co-host is going to bug me for those. But anyways, guys, backlash tonight. Yep. Um, we'll talk about the pre-show. We'll get into your tweets as well. We'll talk about the main card, and I'll give my solid review rating at the end of the podcast. So... Let's start off with your tweets out there. And we have a couple. I think we have a couple. I think we have uh, two or three to read from. All right. First off, we're going to get it to our number one fan, as always. And someone I enjoy reading his tweets. He's hilarious. Go follow him on Twitter at Real Michael Chow. He says. Better than SummerSlam for sure, but a 7 out of 10 for me. That ending, though, did send me home happy compared to SummerSlam. Michael Shaw also says, Pros Becky Balboa with the hashtag wins the big fight. Heath Slater becomes the richest man in Richmond, and AJ's phenomenal low kick for the big win. I agree with you there. This is definitely a phenomenal low kick. Um, it made sense. We'll get into that later. But yeah, Becky Boa with the big win. Cons no more Slater. Cons no more Slater. Super free agent. Maurice Blind Ziggler's future. And Bray Wyatt closes the door on Orton's ankle and match. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, we'll get into that later as well. It was but Orton suffers a concussion from uh, Lesnar's elbow shots, yet still books him in the pay per view match. WWE proves they don't care. Yes, yes, very interesting. We'll get into that too. Uh, he also puts Ambrose was booed tonight. And a question from Michael Chow Do you think it was because fans wanted AJ to win or have fans turn on Ambrose like Roman? Um, I don't mean me and Corporal Cap are watching it tonight. It, it, we, we did notice like there was a lot of unusual boos and reading over Twitter. People are saying that uh, it's just them being pissed at RB for the Orton situation and when it pertaining to the Ambrose and Styles match. I, I honestly think it was just the fans wanting AJ Styles to finally win that major championship in the WWE, and he finally did. And he's become now the triple crown winner in terms of companies. He's the first wrestler ever to hold the IWGP, ROH, um, TNA, and WWE World title all in his career. So good for AJ Styles. Definitely well-deserved championship for him. And I'm excited to see the run he has with the championship. Next tweet comes from Tony Mercer at Recrem. Why not on Twitter? I, oh, I think I'm saying that all the time wrong, Tony. I apologize. Um, it is late here where I am recording this, so bear with me. He says, overall, a solid event, but strange. Wyatt match was awful. I agree with that. All the title bouts were good to, to great, especially that main event. Exactly. I agree with you, Tony. 100% that Wyatt match was something else. We'll get into that later as well. Last set of tweets come from Chuck Wilson. He says, jobbing Wyatt out to Kane was dumb. They finally make him look uh, predatory and then that shit. He says, the main event finish was 
will make up for a solid feud as long as Ambrose plays it serious. Yes. I'll get into that later, Chuck, as well. Um, he also says, heel Usos rock. Nice to see them re- uh, reinvented. Yes, 100%. Agree with you. Finally, we get something out of the Usos, and he puts in all hail the women's champ, the last kicker. Uh, I hear you, Chuck Wilson. Finally, a well-deserved women's champion as well. So, guys, that's it for the tweets. Uh, I don't think I got any more. No, I don't. Uh, anyways, we'll get into the Backlash review now. So, Backlash started with the pre-show. It had an hour pre-show for a three-hour-long pay-per-view, single-branded pay-per-view, that had literally six matches announced. Almost five, but we ended up having a sixth match. So... I don't understand why they needed this hour-long pre-show. They literally could have done just a half-hour pre-show, just like a SmackDown during the week. During the week, I guess they just wanted to be like more pay-per-view style and get that hour-long pre-show. But it just it felt like it was just way too long, and I was getting bored of it. I was walking around, not barely watching my TV with this pre-show. I only waited until the Corbin and Apollo Crews segment came on. Um, so speaking of that, we had Daniel Bryan and Apollo Crews talking backstage. Uh, just like Brian saying how much he likes uh, Apollo Crews, just needs to loosen up, and they're doing some other stuff that I'm just like, oh, it just it felt awkward. Like it, it's almost like they're trying way too hard with Apollo Crews, and it, it, and like it's right with Daniel Bryan saying that he needs to loosen up, but we all know he's not going to loosen up. He's going to listen to exactly what WWE tells him to do, and he basically it's going to be Vince's hand talking through his mouth. Like we're not going to get the Apollo Crews loosened up apollo as we want and something we can get behind because that i don't even know what the hell that backstage segment was it was just awkward then finally we get corbin stepping in okay now i can get behind this he comes in and starts calling out daniel bryan saying like uh what did he say uh yeah he said like i would i beat your champion two weeks ago and you left me off smackdown last week and now you're leaving me off the backlash is not fair in a way he's right he did beat the champion two weeks ago i mean and he's one of the your your future talents on SmackDown and probably one of the better wrestlers on your brand, Daniel Bryan. So why not have him on the main card? But anyways, he books Corbin versus Cruz on the pre-show. Why on the pre-show? I don't understand. Like Corbin and Cruz could have been saved for the main card. And then we could have had something we could have had without later on the show, Wyatt and Kane, which I'll get into later and how pissed I am about that. But what the hell? We have this as a pre-show match. We could have had, like, Kalisto face someone or uh, showcase a cruiserweight match. I know they're not going to be on SmackDown, but just showcase a cruiserweight classic match because build up for their two-hour special on Wednesday. Why not have them showcase here at Backlash in the pre-show instead of having your two future number one talents on your roster being a pre-show match for your first ever branded pay-per-view. Yeah, that makes sense. Good booking. Great booking. It's fantastic. Anyways, this should have been like at least the number one contenders match. We didn't get that either because Dan O'Brien is trying to get behind these guys. Get You don't give them a number one contenders match. You just have them face each other for nothing. That is terrible misuse of talent if I've ever seen some. That was terribly done. Really, really bad booking. So they ended up having their pre-show match. Um, the crowd was very over with both talents as they should. Both guys are incredible. More on Apollo Crews' side as he is the face in this situation, so that makes sense. Into the match. It was a really good match. Uh, a lot of good shots back and forth. Corbin ends up winning clean, which is unreal. I didn't think he was going to win clean. I thought he was going to win at least dirty. But no, Corbin wins with the end of days. And Derby needs to do something with these guys quick. Um, because the momentum is just building and building and building behind both of them, or at least, you know, have them feud with each other, because then I can get behind that, and then lead them into the main card somewhere, stop having these pre-show matches if they're going to continue that way, because both these guys are incredible pieces of talent and need to be utilized way better on SmackDown. SmackDown is supposed to be the show where the new era talents gets their opportunities, not get their opportunities to be on the pre-show. That's just stupid. So... That was your pre-show. What else we had in the pre-show? We had a, uh, the panel. Okay, this was interesting. So midpoint in the pre-show match, they start advertising Orton and Wyatt's match. And, and I didn't know what happened. And we found out later in the show what happened and how they played it out. But at this point, I'm like, okay. Um, I found out like a couple hours ago that Orton was injured and the match was canceled. But they're still advertising it. 
Um, is something going to happen? And they don't mention anything. I'm waiting for something to happen on the pre-show and nothing. And it just confused the hell out of me. And I bet you it confused a lot of people out there too. And then I guess you can say like, oh, no, no one's looking at their computers though. Or no, no one checks the dirt sheets. Well, I'm pretty sure now in this generation age and of wrestling fans and how big the IWC has become, I think everyone's on Twitter. And everyone's checking the dirt sheets for anything. So I'm pretty sure everyone knew something was happening with Orton before this match even started, before we got later on the show ever happened. So I just felt like it was unnecessary. Um, we also had a, a moment on the pre-show the, in the social media lounge uh, with Slater and Rhino. It was actually pretty hilarious. I enjoyed these guys. Um, they're growing on me every day. I, at first, I thought it was really stupid. But then you know what? I'm actually enjoying this tag team. Both are well-deserved uh, pieces of talent. Uh, I'm, I'm actually really proud of Rhino. He's getting a second run to WWE here uh, after like seeing him earlier in the year in like a, a three. Actually, it was like a three. Uh, Corporate Cappy, correct me. It's like a 300 seat uh, convention center wrestling for House of Hardcore. And it was in, in our hometown, so we went to go see it. And I can't believe he's gone from that to now being the tag team champions which we'll talk about later as well like it's just incredible i'm so proud of both of them he even he's later finally getting his shot too um so yeah uh, a pretty c- funny hilarious social media segment backstage and they're doing this like gimmick where they don't know that it's live and he slater gets told it's live that they're on the air by rhino and it's just it's funny um so anyways we'll get into the main show we start to show off with daniel bryan and shane mcmahon uh, boosting up the pay-per-view because it actually seriously needed some boosting. And I'm not being sarcastic. Like, this was like, the, they did the least build-up for any pay-per-view ever for this one right here. I know they only had, like, two or three weeks to build it, but come on, they could have done a better job. We said this before in the podcast on a Lowdown show that there was so much they could have done in the three weeks that they had and it didn't, and it just it felt bland. I felt really weird before Backlash even started. Like, I didn't know what the hell I was going to expect. Like, it, it was insane. I had no anticipation. I just, basically, I was anticipating it for it to be bad. That's how, <laughs> and that's bad to say. You don't want to anticipate a WWE pay-per-view to be bad, but I can't believe I had to say that. Like, I just, I thought it was going to be horrible. I was waiting for it to be horrible. I was ready for it. But anyways, they announced, uh, end up, they're talking about the pay-per-view and they end up announcing that the women's match is here to start off the show. So we get the six-pack challenge to open the show, which is incredible. What a way to start off the uh, SmackDown's first pay-per-view with a bang. Um, we get the six-pack challenge between Becky Lynch, Naomi, Natalia, Carmella, Nikki Bella, and Alexa Bliss. Um, and it ends up being an elimination-style match. Thank God if it was the other way where it's just one pinfall and that was it, I think it would have been a lot like too cluster fuckish and it just it wouldn't have made sense um so it was a really good match i thought it was definitely over the top and way more what i expected just like this entire pay-per-view is way more than i expected i mean WWE did a good job um for what they had in front of them to build a good pay-per-view and a good pay-per-view quality match for a single brand so it's gonna be interesting to see what they do with clash of champions uh at the end of september um but anyways into the match uh, Alexa Bliss is the first one eliminated, which shocked me, and especially Corporate Capkeys. That's her. That's her girl, or his girl. Sorry, um, he was pretty upset, but uh, I was actually pretty surprised at the fact that Alexa Bliss lost first, because I thought she would be at least the, in the bottom four. Or so, yeah, she gets eliminated in this crazy turnbuckle spot. Uh, Ronaldo is incredible, by the way. Um, he, he knew the name of the turnbuckle spot, and I don't have it written down here. But he, he basically knows the names of every single move in there. And we need commentators like Ronaldo because he can get behind any situation and make it seem like it's Jim Ross. Like, it, it's incredible. Like, the, the love he has for professional wrestling is amazing. And the way he can name every move is just – it gives it that much more authenticity when you're watching something. And Ronaldo is just a great commentator. I love it. But anyways, yep, Alexa Bliss eliminated first with that crazy turnbuckle spot. Um, next person to get eliminated was Naomi. She taps out to the sharpshooter by Natalia, and then Natalia gets pinned right away, like right after that was done by Nikki for with her new uh, finisher. Actually, it was a little bit uh, after. My bad. I jumped the gun there. So yeah, Nikki Bella with her new finisher. I don't even know what she calls it yet. And then right after that, is really shortly after that, is where she gets rolled up by Carmella, and Carmella pins Nikki Bella, unfreaking believable! I lost my mind. I couldn't believe it. So the last two 
or Becky Lynch and Carmella. I honestly thought it was going to be Becky Lynch and Nikki Bella, and there was going to be some sort of like face showdown, and it would have been ending of a really good uh, women's match. We end up getting Carmella rolling up Nikki, and then Nikki uh, slaps the shit out of Carmella right after um, with all that back and forth fighting they've been doing for like the last couple of weeks. And again, we still don't know why the hell they're fighting each other and where the hell the heat behind Carmella and Nikki is. I hope this is going to lead into a feud and we get more explanation out of it in the upcoming weeks leading into No Mercy. Um, so yeah, the last two was Carmella and Becky Lynch. Be- Becky Lynch eventually hits the disarmor and actually gets the win and becomes the first ever SmackDown Women's Champion well, well, well deserved by Becky. Becky Balboa gets it done. Um, she becomes the first ever SmackDown Women's Champion. So good for Becky Lynch. Uh, incredible, incredible piece of talent Becky Lynch is. Uh, if she and she's basically the future of the women's division, one of them at least, and definitely. This is now certified herself as the top woman on SmackDown. Um, there's only one thing I can think of. I loved, I loved it. I loved the situation, but then as shortly after, it ran through my mind, and I'm a hundred percent sure it's run through everyone else's mind, thinking of what's next for Becky Lynch. And you look at her history, and what do you think, or who do you think is going to be the heel to start challenging her for that title next? Yes. The one, the only person in the world that you cringe whenever you look at your television set. That is Eva freaking Marie. It's almost lined up perfectly. She's going to be coming back from suspension soon. From her 30 day wellness policy suspension. And then she's going to get... I know she's going to get it put into this title picture right away. Because she's got some already heat with Becky before she left. And if she becomes the first feud for that woman's title... It will seriously kill all the momentum you have for that division. There's so many more people who deserve a better shot at that women's championship than Eva fucking Marie, who hasn't had a freaking match yet in the WWE or on SmackDown at least. Stupid. You got Alexa Bliss, who definitely deserves, or definitely like one of the best heels on SmackDown, definitely deserves another title shot. Carmella, definitely 100%. I'm not just being biased. She deserves another shot. Nikki Bella could even feud with Becky Lynch. That could be a good feud. You have all these women here who are 100 times better than Alexa, or sorry, than uh, Eva Marie. So just keep Eva Marie off TV after even her suspension is done. Go to film Total Divas and just stay off the TV. Just stay off. Just get off. Don't even look at the title. It's blue. You don't care anymore. You're not part of the blue. You're, you're all about red. Just leave. Go to TNA or something. I don't care, Eva Marie. Just don't come back. Don't ruin this momentum and this run for the SmackDown Women's Division that's slowly and slowly becoming better every goddamn week. Just don't even touch it. Don't. God. Anyways. So after that, we have the Usos versus the Hype Bros in a second chance match after American Alpha were unable to compete due to Chad Gable's storyline injury. So they were taken out of the tournament. So Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon booked a second chance match and the winner would go on to face Heath Slater and Rhino in the Tag Team Championship uh, finals of the tournament. One thing they did good here, the Usos are uh, 100% legitimately heel. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on with their theme in Tynetron. They still got their face uh, theme in Tynetron. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to be uh, soonly changed, but they come out in new attire, more like thug-looking uh, Samoan-type uh, Usos, uh, definitely different than what we're used to seeing. Um I like these new Usos. I like it. I like their attitude. I like that they're heel. And I love the new attire. I can get behind them. They're actually more relevant than they used to be. So I'm loving it. I hope they actually get like a better theme, like a good heel. Like, see, you know what I mean? Like their theme right now sucks. It's, it's more for like a face Usos, not the ones that they, not that the characters are portraying now. So I hope they, they get a new theme soon. Um, the match itself was pretty decent. I love the hype bros. I love the intensity that they have, especially out of Mojo Riley. That guy is incredible and one heck of a piece of talent. He's just su- such like a workhorse. It's incredible. But uh, 
even after Hyper was looking very aggressive and good in this match, the Usos end up picking up the victory, and it just kind of makes sense for a heel team to go to the finals to be the ones to put uh, Slater and Rhino over, um, which we do find out, and in, in, uh, it definitely helped in that situation. But the Usos being heel is definitely a, a, a key here and definitely a boost for the SmackDown tag team division um i do see them winning the titles uh, maybe later on maybe at like no mercy maybe slater and rhino carry it till then the loser to the usos and then maybe by survivor series uh american alpha will be back and healthy and challenge the usos for that for the titles and maybe win it because they're definitely the number one tag team on smackdown and definitely the ones to uh elevate that tag team division and be the front runners for that division let me just take a drink here one, one sec ladies and gentlemen Late night, gotta get that Red Bull in. Anyways, next match, we have the Miz versus Dolph Ziggler for the Intercontinental Championship. Um, again, this feud, I said it before, need, needed more intensity than the promos showed. The promos they did for this match were really good. I loved them, but they weren't 100% truthful. It showed more intensity than actually this feud was built up on. Um... From that Talking Smack episode with The Miz, that's where it should have gone. It should have stayed at that level. But as the weeks came down to it, it just went down. And like we had a little bit of something out of Ziggler. And then last week, I don't even know what the hell that was. That was even Dolph Ziggler. That was like Dolph Ziggler, some female version of Dolph Ziggler. I don't even know what the hell that was. But anyways, we get into this match. Before the match, or before Miz can even have his entrance, he has a promo with Daniel Bryan backstage. Uh, basically saying that he needs to renegotiate his contract because he's been such a good IC champion and that he's about to go defend it and he should, we, that he thinks that he should be negotiating and getting paid like a real A-lister. And then uh, Dean O'Brien just gets mad, doesn't say anything. Miz just calls him a coward. Um, like Dan O'Brien was trying to call Miz a coward on Talking Smack. And then Miz says, I'm going to have to go do what you can't do anymore. So basically a jab at Dan O'Brien saying that he can't wrestle anymore. And Miz is going to go out and do something that he loves to do. So looks like they're continuing this uh, this way of jabbing at Dan O'Brien for not wrestling anymore. And he can't wrestle anymore. I don't know if this is going to lead to a match. For him, I really don't think that's a good idea because Dan O'Brien's officially retired. They've deemed him uncleared to compete anymore. Like I don't understand why some that like one day it's gonna pop out and say, Oh yeah, your neck's suddenly better for some reason. You're allowed to wrestle now, Daniel Bryan. Or they're just good they, it's the same condition and they're just gonna let him wrestle because Daniel Bryan wants to wrestle and he doesn't care about the consequences. But it's not how it works. Um so I don't know what they're going with this. I don't know if it's gonna end up in a Miz Daniel Bryan match later down the line. I don't know. We'll have to see. Um I can't really make an opinion until it happens. So anyways into the match we go. It was actually a pretty decent match. A really good back and forth effort. Uh, There's a lot more intensity in the match than the promos itself. Um, we had a lot of uh, spots where Miz was mocking Dan O'Brien with his own moves and taunts. I thought it was pretty. That was pretty good. Um, definitely more jabs. Dan O'Brien creating this heat between the Miz and the general manager of SmackDown. Uh, even though the build up sucked, I thought the match was actually great. It was really good, really well done. Except. The ending. The ending of this match, I don't think it was needed. They, they're they trying to make Miz be this credible intercontinental champion, making him more intense and making him more legit. But then you have the ending like this where Maurice pulls out this like perfume or pepper spray, something, just, just pulls it out, sprays Dolph Ziggler in the face while the ref's distracted, and that's what causes Miz to hit the skull-crushing finale and the win. Now, I don't see how that can make him a credible champion when you have him cheat like that. And you, you have him be all this in te- intense the last couple of weeks heading into this match and like saying that he, 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 he's worth contract negotiations to be this A-lister. And you have the match ended like that. Why couldn't he just win cleanly? Because that would have made more sense. That would have backed him up. When going to Daniel Bryan said, look, I just beat Dolph Ziggler clean. He had a world title match uh, at SummerSlam, so I definitely deserve to be, you know, renegotiated with my contract and make more money. But because they ended it this way, I know people are going to say, no, it's because he's a heel. It's a good heel tactic. But you know what? If they're trying to make Miz the credible character and be that Intercontinental Champion that's more credible and who deserves to be Intercontinental Champion, that was terrible. That was terribly done. I think I would have done it a way different way, but... uh, 
I think one way I could have done it uh, is da- Dana Bryan should have came out after the match and restarted the match. And if they wanted to, have Miz win it clean then or have Ziggler win the title and stop getting, you know, jobbed for like the last 10 years of his life. <laughs> like the guy, I feel so bad for the guy. Like, it, and it's like what I said before. He's in this cycle. He's going to start at the top. He wins or he loses at the top. He goes to the mid card. He loses the mid card. He's going to start jobbing for a bit now. And I guarantee you we'll see him in a world title match at some point in the next year and a half or two. I guarantee it. Ah, sorry, guys. So let's move on. <clears throat> and I'm going to take another drink for this, guys, because... <laughs> I'm going to be ranting hardcore about this next next uh, next match, I guess you can call it. Okay. <clears throat> so next, we have Bray Wyatt come out. And I know you guys already know where this is going. Bray Wyatt comes out. The announcer announces that Randy Orton is unable to compete due to we saw earlier that uh, Bray Wyatt was backstage beating up Orton with a door, having his leg in it for some reason, and playing the injury angle, I guess. Um, and then that was the end of that. So now we get to this part where the announcer is announcing that Randy Orton can't compete due to injury, and then uh, Bray Wyatt insists the count of 10 to signify a forfeit. The announcer counts to 10. That's it. And as Bray Wyatt's about to leave, the announcer says, however, Bray Wyatt will compete in a no disqualification match against. (sighs) And I don't know why they think putting this guy on TV is such a good idea and will boost SmackDown or anything. But out comes Kane. That's got to be Kane. Mr. I don't know. Went to retire himself. Comes out and faces Bray Wyatt in a no disqualification match. That's fantastic. That's that's just great. Because you know, radio because Randy Orton's gone. Hmm. We got we got to think of something that to either e- equally make this good or even better. Why not put Kane in there? Oh, that makes sense. That's great. Let's let's put Kane in there. Yeah, for sure. At least it wasn't the Milkman. If the Milkman came out and Bray just squashed him in a move, I would have been even more upset and be like, why the fuck did I waste my time watching that? Poor Bray Wyatt. I honestly feel bad for this dude. Could He could have had a really good match with Randy Orton. But instead, he's got a slower than molasses of a match with Kane. Like, Kane is just so slow now. It's incredible. And he is exactly Mr. I don't know when to retire himself because he doesn't know when to leave TV because I don't even know if it's ever be making him come back. I'm sure as hell think he doesn't want to be here. Guy so the politics. It's just he, does, he doesn't care. I don't understand why. I mean, he has the love of wrestling. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure he loves what he does. But he's useless. We don't need him on TV. He's not a draw. Just keep him off TV. If I could see one positive out of this match, like one positive at all, it was a table spot with Bray Wyatt. You know, it's always cool seeing it now. would get smashed to bits, and it was a pretty cool uh, that that splash that Bray Wyatt does. Um, there were some other spots where it looked pretty close that it was going to be the end of the match. Um, like there was a choke slam, and if Bray had lost at that choke slam, I probably would have threw my controller at the TV. Um, like I would have lost it. But guess what? Not only did he didn't lose at that part, he did end up losing. So Bray Wyatt loses to Kane. Yeah, you heard that right. Bray Wyatt lost to Kane. You have got to be shitting me. Who backstage thinks losing to Kane will make Bray Wyatt the face of fear on SmackDown and like one of the top guys? On SmackDown. How? How does losing to Kane? If someone knows out there why losing to Kane makes sense, please fill me in and maybe the rest of the wrestling community because we don't fucking know what the hell that was. I am so, so pissed off. 
I don't understand. Why have Bray Wyatt be billed as the face of fear and be and telling himself that he's God and lose the cane? God loses the cane. Okay, so he's a god that loses to Kane. That makes so much sense. Kane, who hasn't been relevant since I don't know when, is the one to beat Bray Wyatt. That makes oh, I can't. It makes me sick when I say that. I know he had help. Randy Orton came out, even though he was supposed to be injured, and it was able to deliver an RKO, even though it, legitimately he is injured. He's got to go through uh, concussion protocol. So how does WWE let this guy come out and, and and pull an RKO and risk something? Does that show that WWE don't give a shit? I think it maybe it shows that they don't give a shit about their part-time talent because then, you know, they don't give a shit. It's just, they're just part-time. They can go away whenever they want. I don't know. I, I, I know we had a question earlier. I think it was Michael Chow that asked me that. But you know what? I don't, I don't understand why they could let someone who needed a concussion protocol test that, you know what? We haven't got, we're going to have you go out there and give an RKO. You should be fine. Just, you know, if you hit your head, then, well, we, we fucked up. We're sorry. No, that's not how it works. If he's got to go through concussion protocol, like concussion is a huge thing in every other sport, then you keep him off TV and you don't let him go out there and risk anything. I don't understand that. I know like he had help. So we get back to the situation at hand here uh, of Bray Wyatt losing to Kane. So we know we had help from Randy Orton, but still, I don't understand. So two part-timers just squashed Randy Orton or just squashed Bray Wyatt like that. This is maybe the stupidest booking I have ever seen. Is Vince Russo booking this shit? Because that's something like Vince Russo would do. Is that so dumb? Kane, just retire already, man. I know you can't figure it out. Just retire. We'll all be happy if you just hang up the mask because we don't care. We need more TV time for people who well deserve it, like Apollo Crews and Barry Corbin. Like that match could have been on the main card in that spot. Rather than us watching Kane face Bray Wyatt in a match that no one gave a shit about. Fantastic, that would be fantastic. So let's move on. We on to the Tag Team Championships. The finals of the inaugural tournament. Heath Slater and Rhino versus the Usos. Uh, huge reaction for Slater and Rhino when they came out as they should. Um, Usos still getting a lot of heat, which I love. I love the crowd finally giving the Usos the, the heat they deserve. Like, I mean, they were booing them before because they were tied with Roman Reigns, but now it makes more sense. And like, uh, you need a heel team like them, and for you, the, it's good to get the heat that they got because it makes them that credible heel team as well. Um, the match itself was pretty decent. Um, I love the finish. The finish says it all. We have uh, Rhino giving the gore. I think it was to Jay Uso. Slater rolling over, getting the pin, and then getting the win. And and he Slater and Rhino becoming your first ever inaugural SmackDown Tag Team Champions. He Slater gets a contract. He saves his kids. He gets an upground pool. He gets a double wide trailer. He gets the whole shebang. Buys all the cheese cans and crackers he wants. And his kids can go to school or whatever. Whatever is going on with them, I don't know. I don't even know how many kids he has. But, uh... Definitely well deserved for both men. Um, Rhino, like I said before, I, I just see him like half a year ago in a 300 seat indie wrestling promotion, and then now he's winning the tag team championships on SmackDown and being credible again. So I love it. Both well deserved again, as I said. Um, the rain, I think, is probably going to last maybe till No Mercy. Like I said, also, um, the Uso is probably going to win it from them. Um, but this is awesome for the time being. I love them as the tag team champions. Uh, they can definitely, uh, elevate that division a little bit, bring some humor to it. And, uh, definitely the crowd is way over behind them, which makes it even better. So good for Slater. Good for Rhino. And we'll see where it goes from there, uh, on SmackDown this week. So getting to the main event, Dean Ambrose versus AJ Styles and another match that had a lack of a feud. For the match that we got tonight, a unre- if we had a better promo and a better build-up, this probably would have been in contention or a candidate for a match of the year. Um, so, yeah, they needed a better feud, way better. I mean, we had that stupid little segment last week with the kick to the balls. and I mean, it, it just, I don't know, it could have been way better. But nonetheless, 
Uh, really, I was really anticipated for it because I, I was really guaranteed to get behind AJ Styles. I thought this was going to be the night that he was going to win it. The crowd was split right down the middle. Uh, it sounded more towards AJ Styles, but it ended up being an unreal match. Um, way more than I expected. Again, like I said before, like this cart, this pay per view just showed way more than what I actually thought I was going to get shown. Um, so yeah, a lot of good spots back and forth by Styles and Ambrose. Uh, Kyoto ends up getting kind of blinded for a bit near the end. Styles low blows Dean Ambrose just like he did on SmackDown. He hits a Styles Clash. Really awkwardly, I might add. Um, it almost didn't look good. Hits a Styles Clash. AJ wins. Yes, perfectly done. The whole ending just made sense. And it'd be that credible heel champion AJ Styles, even though he's way over with the crowd. This was perfectly done. Great booking. Styles wins. He becomes your new WWE World Heavyweight Champion and is now the first ever wrestler ever to win the TNA, WWE, and IWGP as well as the Ring of Honor Championship in his career. Perfect way to end the night and a perfect way to send this feud into No Mercy. I think this feud is going to continue into No Mercy where after that, Styles will still be champion and John Cena will end up coming back, challenging Styles for that title and end up at Survivor Series where Cena will probably beat Styles, I'm saying, or maybe by Royal Rumble and be and pass Ric Flair and beat that record. So, other than that, guys, back last night, again, like I just said, way more, way, way better than I expected, 100%. So, if I'm giving it a rating out of 10, it'll probably be, I'm going to say 7 out of 10. Just because of the whole Kane segment. Kane brought it down to 7. I probably would say 8.5, but Kane brought it down to 7. Just keep him off TV, guys. Just keep him off TV, WWE. Just keep him off, and I won't have to rain anymore. But anyways, guys, that's going to do it for Backlash, the review. And then we'll see you later on this week on the Lowdown Show. Our lowdown show will probably be, I'm going to say, either a Wednesday or Thursday, I believe. Um, well, just stay tuned. Follow us on Twitter and check us out, and we'll let you know there. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching. And remember, every week the lowdown show is broadcasted, and every other podcast is broadcasted live on Spreaker at Spreaker.com slash NHBWP. And after that, it's posted in full on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, Spreaker, and Stitcher. We are everywhere for your enjoyment, and it is easier for you and convenient for you to listen to. If you'd like to join in on the conversation and have your thoughts, opinions, and questions read and discussed on the podcast, tweet us at NoHoldsBarWP. Also follow us on at NoHoldsBarWP. And by dropping a comment in the comment section on YouTube, I am your host, as always, guys, the self-proclaimed greatest host. And I'll see you all later on The Lowdown Show. Blue-collar boys do it with their hands, money.